All right. I'm pleased today to introduce Dr. Leanne Mike. She is a clinical associate professor of pharmacy, and she's the assistant director for education in the Plein Center for Geriatric Pharmacy Research, Education and Outreach. She's also our Northwest GWEX curriculum advisor for pharmacy. Yay! And her <laughs> um, general interest is in the care of older adults with an emphasis on deep prescribing and acute care. Her work involves direct patient care, education, curriculum design and implementation. And she's going to talk to us today about medication use in older adults with updated information um, from the American Geriatric Society meeting and information about the beers criteria. So thank you so much, Dr. Mike, and take it away. Right. Thank you so much. I'm glad to see there are folks on the call on the webinar. Uh, I know, well, at least in Seattle, it's a nice sunny day, and I can imagine people are itching to get outside and enjoy the sun, but I appreciate you being here uh, with us today. Um, as Barb mentioned, so I'm a pharmacist by training, and so I'm going to be talking a lot about medications. Um, when I was preparing for this talk, I'm like, hmm, there's a lot of issues surrounding medication use in older adults. In fact, I, I think I could describe our whole pharmacy school curriculum about uh, on that. So what what I um, really worked hard today to, to share with you is some of the more recent updates, particularly things that I, I um, heard and were current at the American Geriatric Society meeting, which happened earlier this month. So that's going to be the focus. I mean, there's a whole lot more out there that I'm not covering, um, but I thought that having some recent updates and some actionable items that you can kind of implement right away would be really helpful in your practices. So with that being said, uh, we're going to discuss some important concepts related to medication use, uh, particularly Beer's criteria, polypharmacy, prescribing cascades, and deprescribing. And um, since the Beer's criteria was just released earlier this month, I wanted to kind of dive a little bit deeper because there are quite a number of changes compared to the last update from a few years ago. And then lastly, I want to um, practice applying some of these concepts to a particular patient case. And so just to give you a preview and get you started thinking, I've selected one patient case, um, patient that I was um, involved in, in caring for. And we're gonna kind of take one case and look at it from the different angles and different lenses of the different uh, important concepts that we're talking today. So that's how we're gonna proceed. Um, I also wanted to kind of share with you a slightly different prescription for a different perspective on the four M's. So one of the things um, we've incorporated into even our pharmacy school teaching for, for pharmacy students is the concept of the four M's. Uh, but one thing that I've observed is that as pharmacy students, there is very much of a kind of a silo focus on only the medications and not so much how it interrelates with the other three M's. So my hope is today that we will have an opportunity to share how medication affects what matters and what matters most to a patient affects medication choices. And the same thing is true for how medications and mobility interact and mentation and medication and kind of all of the mobility matters most in mentation interact. So I've included the arrows and because my um, focus today is on medications, of course, I put that at the top, um, but, <laughs> but they're all important. Um, but yeah, that's the lens that I'm going to be working through today. So showing how all of the four M's interact together with the primary focus on medication. So that'll be the, 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 the way we're going to do it. So let's step back a little bit and, and think about why medications are such an important part of the four M's. Um, anybody who's worked with older adults will recognize that many older adults have multiple comorbidities. Uh, the term that's emerging in the literature now is called multimorbidity. So that means those people with multiple co comorbidities. So that, that if you haven't heard that term yet, we're, you may start hearing it more frequently. It, it means people, people with multiple comorbidities. So we know older adults can have multimorbidity. We also know that many older adults can take lots of medications, um, which the term for that is considered polypharmacy. Um, the definition of what number of meds constitutes or is considered polypharmacy is a little bit 
kind of, I don't know, it depends on what source you look at, but generally it's around five medications for most definitions. Um, so if you can think back to how many people that you've cared for, interacted with, who've had more than five medications, and I would say, ooh, I would say most of my patients have had polypharmacy. So here we've got older adults with comorbidities who take lots of medications. And then we also know that physiologically bodies change as they age. And as a result of that, an older adult's response to medications can change with age. So this includes things like, you know, renal function slows down as people age, the blood vein barrier becomes a little bit more um, like let's extra stuff inside. And so medications and doses that were um, just right for a patient when they're younger may be too much or even dangerous as they get older. So, you know, recognizing that the response to medications can change. Additionally, right, and it kind of tied with all of these things that adverse drug reactions are pretty common and they can consult in considerable morbidity. Uh, additionally, we're concerned about inappropriate prescribing. Um, so medications that are maybe the not the safest choice, not the safest dose, not the safest regimen could contribute all to not just polypharmacy, but adverse drug reactions. So one of the ways that we can kind of address some of these concerns is not only just knowing about multimedic morbidity and polypharmacy, knowing which, which drugs may be potentially inappropriate as people get older, but how to kind of scale back on medications, which is what the deprescribing term is about. So it's intentional, it's structured, it's rational, of uh, kind of scaling back, discontinuing or reducing doses of medications. Um, and as a result of that, the total medication burden a patient experiences can go down. And as I mentioned on the last slide, medications can kind of impact the other three M's. So there's a lot of reasons, and I think I've just shared kind of the whole pharmacy school curriculum on one slide, but don't tell my students that because it's a little bit more in depth and detailed than that. Okay, so those are why, why it's important. So next I wanted to transition and, and kind of go into the next um, segment. So what we're gonna do in the next couple of kind of segments, 10, 15, 20, I'm not sure how long it'll be take, probably 15 minutes for beers criteria, and then we'll talk about uh, prescribing cascades and deprescribing. All right, so within your handout, I have included, and hopefully this all translated correctly so that you, you, got, you have access to this, but I've asked for you to have access to the most recent beers criteria update. Um, so that should be tapped on. Um, this is gonna be a really helpful resource um, and I'm gonna point out some tips as we go through some of the updates. So again, this was just published earlier this month. So I wish I could take credit for having drafted it or been involved in it, but I will take credit for sharing the updates with you. So this is the, um, the 2023 updated AGS Spears criteria for potentially inappropriate medications. And for those of you looking at the screen, you probably saw the red underscore. And this is really one of the key messages I want you to take away about the Beers criteria is that if a medication is on the list, it doesn't mean it's absolutely inappropriate. It's just potentially inappropriate. So it's sort of a clue for us to think more carefully about a patient's medications and not just to see the name of a drug, say, oh, it's on the beers list, we need to get rid of it. No, what happened, what should happen is we see a medication, we know it's on the beers list, think more carefully about what's within the beers criteria, what the guidance is, and what patient um, situation or specific factors um, may make that completely appropriate for the patient or it could be inappropriate. So it's not just, here's a list of medications to discontinue if your patient is on them, okay? So a key, these are potentially inappropriate, not absolutely inappropriate. So within the Beers criteria, um, just a couple of another kind of framing device or uh, a ways to frame it is that 
The idea behind the Beers criteria is to reduce older adults' exposure to potentially inappropriate medications. And, and that is hopefully accomplished through improving medication selection. So selecting medications that have a better side effect profile, um, more, effic more effective, safer, um, and then ad adjusting the dose to match the best, um, the best amount of dose for a patient's, um, you know, uh, kidney, liver function, other drugs, drug interactions, that kind of thing. So it's meant to reduce the adult's exposure to potentially inappropriate medications. It's meant to educate cl clinicians and patients, and it's meant to serve as a tool to evaluate the quality of care, cost, and patterns of drug use. So you'll notice that the intention is not to discontinue any Beers criteria medication on your patient's profile. Okay, so the other takeaway is that the criteria are intended to be applied to older adults, 65 and older, across all care settings. So that includes ambulatory care, acute care, institutional care. Um, but, but these recommendations, these criteria should not be applied and they're not applicable to patients who are in hospice care or receiving end of life care. Okay, so these are for people who are in all care settings, but not hospice and end of life uh, care settings. The criteria are divided into five major categories, which you can see on the slide here. So as the title of the paper implies, these are medications that are considered potentially inappropriate, and we'll go through some snapshots of what, what the tables look like. So medications considered potentially inappropriate, medications inappropriate in patients with certain diseases or syndromes, medications that should be used with caution, um, potentially inappropriate drug-drug interactions, and medications whose dosage should be adjusted based off of renal function. So those are the main categories. There's some additional stuff, and I, the way I've um, constructed this, we're going to go through all of the major tables within Beer's criteria. Um, if you've ever had a chance to look at any version of Beer's criteria, know that it, the majority of the, the, the paper is table, pages of tables with some text interspersed throughout. So, um, so it's really more of a reference and uh, I use it as a resource and a tool and I will ask my students to get it out whenever we're talking about uh, assessing or evaluating a patient's medications just so that they can kind of reference it in the moment. Um, I myself, even in preparation for this talk, um, used it kind of side by side because I can't remember all of the things on there um, as accurately as I probably need to. So I would advise you have a copy handy, consult it frequently, because again, there are nuances to some of the recommendations that go beyond just stopped using the drug. Okay. Um, so a couple of noteworthy changes compared to the most recent um, uh, update. So um, what we've learned over the last few years is that we've got a lot more clinical experience with, with direct oral anticoagulants. And so those have actually been broken out into a special box that summarizes all of the recommendations across warfarin, excuse me, warfarin plus the direct oral anticoagulants. So I'll, I'll show you a snapshot of that. There is a separate list of drugs with strong anticholinergic properties, which my students are going to love because I don't recall this being in any of the prior versions of criteria. And I'm like, you're the pharmacist. You're going to need to know which ones have strong anticholinergic properties. Well, now, <laughs> now when I teach this with this, uh, this updated version, they're going to be able to go right to that table and identify easily. So... And that actually will make it easier for everybody, not just the, the pharmacy students who are in my classes who I may do that. Um, there is also a list of drugs from the 2019 criteria that are still considered potentially inappropriate. And I'm sorry, <laughs> excuse me, PIM stands for potentially inappropriate medication. So there are some medications that are still considered potentially inappropriate, but they have been moved out of the main tables because usage is low or it's not currently available in the United States. But if folks in other countries are still using it and, and have access to those medications, they would still be listed. 
Um, there have been some, some re modifications to the criteria. There has been some extended, re extended rationale for anticholinergic drugs, which is uh, now described within the tables as cumulative cholinergic burden. So medications that have anticholinergic properties, right? You add them together and there's a cu cumulative cholinergic burden, burden, which can be um, harmful for patients. And then for those of you who have been following, the U.S. Presented Preventive Services Task Force released some guidelines not too long ago about aspirin for primary prevention. It's actually no longer recommended. And so that change is also reflected in the BEERS criteria. Uh, one more note about how to use the BEERS criteria and interpret the language written within. You'll, um, if you read carefully, you'll see the word avoid throughout. And that again, that doesn't mean stop using it, get rid of it, it's contraindicated, it doesn't mean any of those things. In the, in the context of Beer's criteria, avoid means the medication should be avoided except under unusual circumstances. So one example of an unusual circumstance could be that a patient tried a safer alternative and didn't achieve the desired outcome. And so the next step would be to try another medication which may end up being on the beers criteria. So again, avoid is not an absolute contraindication except if it's listed as such in the medication label. And kind of the, just to restate it a slightly different way, that a patient, when you're caring for a patient and selecting a medication, prescribing a medication, reviewing a medication, um, that some patients may need to be on potentially inappropriate medications and they would be chosen infrequently, but through careful consideration of benefit and risk. So again, this is intentional, it's thoughtful, there's a plan in place, it's um, you know with full knowledge of what some of the downsides might be of doing that. So again, you can do it. It needs to be careful, thoughtful, well planned out. The patient needs to be aware so they can monitor. Um, and there would be some careful considerations before um, prescribing somebody on a medication that's listed on the beers criteria. All right, so I think I will pause for a second and ask if there are any questions. Um, before we move into the snapshots for the different tables. I don't see any questions yet. Okay. Okay, well, I will proceed. Um, if questions arise, please, please type in the chat um, and, um, and we'll just address them when we get to it. Okay, so the major table in, um, in Beer's criteria is table two. It's the largest, it's the most extensive, um, and I, I wanted to at least call to your attention that I'm only sharing like just a portion of the table. If you were to look in the actual paper, it would be multiple pages long. Um, but at least the snapshot that I've put on the screen um, gives you a sense across a few different um, therapeutic categories of how this might play out. So at the top of the slide, you can see that the, the columns are organ system therapeutic category, which includes medication names. What's the rationale? What's the recommendation and quality of evidence and strength of recommendation? Now, this is really important to really pay attention to the rationale and the recommendation because there are nuances there that go beyond just stop using this drug. Okay, and this is an exercise that I ask all of my students to do. They need to understand and explain why something is potentially inappropriate. They can't just say, oh, it's potentially inappropriate. Like I need to know why. And within the examples, there are, there are some nuances. So let's, let's do a couple. So um, the first category is antihistamines and generally uh, first, first generation antihistamines are um, highly anticholinergic. So um, you would see these again show up on the table of highly anticholinergic drugs. And so the, um, the main reason we care are concerned about highly anticholinergic drugs is that there is a risk of confusion, dry mouth, constipation, potentially um, uh, making a patient more at risk or actually causing delirium. 
um, and could worsen falls and um, risk of dementia. So this is a really great reason why we want to avoid them. Um, you'll notice that underneath the rationale for diphenhydramine, it doesn't. It does allow some um, consideration for use. For example, if this is uh, acute treatment of an allergic reaction, that may be appropriate. But otherwise, you want to avoid it. And the quality of evidence and strength is moderate and strong. So in general, we're avoiding first-generation antihistamines because their anticholinergic properties which include all of the things that I mentioned and are described here on the table. Uh, you may not be able to see all the details on the screen, um, but you can look at the table in, in the handout that should um, be um, uh, big enough for everybody to see. Um, the next one I just wanted to point out is nitrofurantoin. Um, I know many of our students in the pharmacy school are nitrofurantoin, don't use it. But if you look at the rationale and the recommendation, there's some nuance there. So the reason we don't like to use it, uh, it can cause or has a risk for causing pulmonary toxicity, hepatotoxicity, and peripheral neuropathy, especially with long-term use. So to me, that means hmm, there may be some situations in which short-term use may be okay, but it's the long-term use that can put patients at risk for those toxicities. And so in the recommendation, it will say avoid for patients with creatinine clearance less than 30 mils per minute. So those patients with some reduced renal function or for long-term suppression. So again, a little bit more nuanced than just don't use it. Um, you'll note, I mentioned on a prior slide that aspirin is shown. So aspirin for primary prevention is now on the table. Um, and the rationale includes risk for bleeding, um, lack of net benefit uh, when using an older adults for primary prevention. Um, but a note that if this is for secondary prevention in patients with established cardiovascular disease, these recommendations don't apply. So for primary prevention, the risk seems to outweigh any potential benefits. Now, the area that's still kind of out there where we're not quite sure how to navigate this quite as well is what do we do if somebody's on it? So do we stop it? Do we continue on? Uh, but definitely, it seems more clear if your patient has not been on it and it's for primary care or primary prevention, don't even start it. Okay, so avoid starting it for primary prevention and then consider deprescribing in somebody who's already taking it. So the recommendation, the quality of evidence is high and the low strength of recommendation is pretty strong. Again, on this slide, warfarin also is pulled out. I don't recall warfarin being um, so prominent on um, the last version of Beer's criteria. And the reason is that when it's compared to direct oral anticoagulant, anticoagulants, warfarin has a higher risk of bleeding, particularly intracranial bleeding. And so um, those of you who are prescribing for patients with AFib for prevention of stroke, um, you'll remember that the guidelines for that include direct oral anticoagulation, anticoagulants even before considering warfarin. Okay, so this is meant to align with those guideline updates. Um, so there may be some patients for, for whom warfarin is still appropriate. Um, and it's called out here in this box. So if somebody's been on it long-term and they have a pretty good time within the therapeutic range um, and they're handling it well and they figured out their diet and things are going smoothly for them, there's no reason to automatically stop it. So for, for those people who are well-controlled, stabilized, things are going well for them, then it may be reasonable to continue. But if you're thinking about starting new, um, I. Uh, based on all the recommendations uh, for, um, I would recommend doing, uh, considering a direct oral anticoagulant before warfarin. Okay, so table two actually continues on for a number of other pages. Again, I just wanted to show you a snapshot so you can kind of see the rationale, because I think that's really important in the decision-making process. And this is what I ask my students to do too. Like, let's look and see why. Okay. Um, 
This box one is a synthesis of the anticoagulation recommendations. So this puts together all of the current understanding of how we use the different anticoagulants. Um, and so a couple of notes is that uh, warfarin should be avoided if it's a new start. Uh, Rivaroxaban actually now has a stronger recommendation to avoid it. Um, and that's partly because of some of the bleeding risks that seem to be higher with rivaroxaban. So if we were gonna prioritize which direct oral anticoagulants, rivaroxaban would be kind of lower on the list and kind of the avoid category. So avoid unless you've tried the other things and they don't seem to be working quite as well. Uh, dabigatran is a use caution. Um, so it's not as strong of a warning as avoid but it does imply that it still needs to be intentional, thoughtful, and weighing the risks and benefits. So kind of the takeaway from all of these um, seems like um, uh, apixaban is kind of the top choice based on what we know in comparative studies from, from all of the oral anticoagulants. So this is kind of call down in a box. You don't have to sort through the text or through long tables to see, see the recommendations called out for you. Table three is um, potentially inappropriate medications in older adults with disease, drug disease or drug syndrome interactions. Um, so a couple here that I, I wanted to point out is within heart failure, um, there are some medications that may be fine in patients who don't have heart failure, but in heart failure may be problematic or risky or cause adverse drug events. So um, things that are included here include dextromethorphan and quinidine um, and pioglitazone or pioglitazone. Um, there's a few other ones too, like diltiazem or apamil. Um, part of the reason they are um, kind of deprioritized or, or were issued with an avoid or used with severe caution is that these medications may exacerbate heart failure, may cause fluid retention. Um, there is a concern for QT prolongation with the dextromethorphan quinidine combo. So again, safer to avoid it. Um, and again, they, the authors of this recommend or, or, or remind us that this is not a comprehensive uh, table. Uh, the recommendation is broken down then by different, different classes. So there's things to be avoided in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, like the non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers that include diltiazem and verapamil, um, and then um, use with caution in patients with heart failure who are asymptomatic and then avoid in patients with symptomatic heart failure, okay? So again, kind of pulling back, you know, these medications by themselves may be perfectly appropriate for patients who don't have heart failure, but if they do have heart failure, there are special considerations to help determine whether this is something that should be started, discontinued, um, and uh, making safer choices for patients. Okay, again, table three continues on through a um, couple of pages of category. Um, again, I didn't want to read the whole um, um, the whole the whole of every table to you. I just wanted to uh, show you a snapshot on how to how to look at it and how to interpret it. And we'll get some practice at the end trying to apply it to our patient case. Okay. Okay, so this is table four. These are potentially inappropriate medications that um, that need that. Oops, sorry. So you should be sorry. These are medications that should be used in caution with older adults. Um, you can see again there are some uh, anticoagulants, antiplatelet agents. Um, the rationale, again, is really important to understand why it should be avoided. Um, if we pull out the antidepressants toward the bottom, these can exacerbate or cause this 
syndrome of inappropriate ADH or in can cause hyponatremia. So you'll need to monitor patients' sodium levels when starting or changing doses, okay? Um, I think that's all I'll highlight on this one. And we'll move on to the next one. Table five includes uh, clinically important drug-drug interactions that should be avoided. So um, the first one would be RAS inhibitors, the renin angiotensin system inhibitors. So that includes ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, uh, anything that affects the renin angiotensin system. You can see some um, the examples here that include, um, uh, even include potassium sparing diuretics. So you want to avoid pairing them up. So two medications that have renin angiotensin system action because it can increase the risk of hyperkalemia. So you wanna avoid using those two different medications who, that have uh, action on the renin angiotensin system. I think opioids and benzodiazepines is not a new one, but it bears repeating that when those are paired together, it increases the risk of overdose and adverse events. Again, avoid. Um, opioids and gabapentin, same thing. I think one of the one of the things that I that I heard presented at the AGS meeting was that there are a lot more people using gabapentinoids as opiates, opioid sparing agents in pain management. And based on the, the action of these different medications that um, it's kind of concerning that people are, are uh, combining these medications, especially since we know that both of them together can increase the risk of sedation and those adverse uh, events. So generally want to avoid it unless you're transitioning across. There may be a little bit of a cross taper with some close monitoring, but generally, um, you know, and I think one of my takeaways from the AGS meeting is that the evidence showing gabapentin treatment for pain that's not neuropathic in nature may not actually be as good as we think it is. And so using it as an opioid sparing agent may actually cause more harm than good for, for some of our patients. Um, avoid adding two anticholinergics together. And then lastly, at least what's on the slide, avoiding a combination of three or more CNS active agents, whether that includes medications that are considered anti-epileptics, antidepressants, antipsychotics, benzos, or the Z drugs that are used for sleep. So avoiding the combination of those. Um, that adding those together could increase risk of falls and fractures. Um, so we want to avoid doing that. Again, some of these agents may be completely appropriate when used alone, but when paired together, they may cause or put the patient more at risk of, of more adverse drug reactions. Okay, moving right along, table six. These are medications that should have their dose reduced with uh, varying levels of kidney function. And this is uh, something that we pharmacists, uh, I've been working with first year pharmacy students this year and we've really been working with them on how to calculate creatinine clearance and look up drugs that, that need to be have their dose adjusted for that. So. Um, you can count on pharmacists. Um, also, you can uh, uh, count on pharmacists to help you out with that. But if you don't have easy access to pharmacists, you, you can uh, do it on your own by looking at this table. So, um, for example, the, the examples I have here are anti-infectives. Um, uh, a couple of notes. If you're not reducing the dose of the medication, it puts the patient more at risk of adverse events. So for ciprofloxacin, there may be some issues with seizure and confusion or tendon rupture. Um, I've already mentioned the side effects of nitrofurantoin. And with trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, you might know that as Bactrim or trim sulfa or Cotrim. Um, this can worsen kidney function and increase the risk of hyperkalemia. And then especially if somebody's on another agent that can cause hyperkalemia. So there are some dose recommendations based off of degree of renal function. Again, these are only a snapshot of the medications that need to be adjusted for renal function. The full paper has a more comprehensive list. 
table seven. These are your drugs with anticholinergic properties. Um, this is my students are gonna think this is wonderful. I, <laughs> I think it's wonderful too. So it's available and accessible to everyone now. So this is helpful for you to um, kind of screen through and recognize which medications are highly anticholinergic and then avoid those if you can and definitely avoid adding them together. Things that are on here include antidepressants, um, some of these antidepressants are not necessarily used for depression, but for other indications. So for example, you may see amitriptyline used for neuropathic pain. So um, that is um, just a note of caution. So based on its therapeutic category, but not necessarily based off of how it's used. Um, I'm gonna skip this one pretty quick since I'm assuming that those in our audience are not even uh, gonna be using these agents, but here they are in case you had, you, you're talking to somebody who is practicing outside the US and has access to these. And then um, these are the new things that have been added since the 2019. So we've already talked about the changes in warfarin and you can review the box one. On, on that. The dextromethorphan quinidine has been added. It's the one that increases QT prolongation in patients with heart failure. Um, opioids have been linked with delirium. Um, anticholinergics can be linked with a history of falls or fractures. So these are all the newer things that added. Ticagrelor has some emerging data that makes it more concerning. And you know, everybody's favorite new medications, the SGLT2 inhibitors, um, while they may be great for diabetes and patients with cardiovascular disease, there are some emerging risks that we just need to be cautious and monitor for. Okay. And then lastly, um, these are is this kind of a summary of the modifications since last time. And I think I've touched on a lot of these. Again, this is not something that I think that people need to memorize, but just have ready access to if you're trying to make clinical decisions. Okay, all right. Um, and I think I've already mentioned the principles, but I've included here for completeness sake so that you you had all of the tables. So remember, this is for potentially inappropriate, not absolutely or definitely inappropriate. Make sure you read the recommendations, the rationale, so you can um, get a better stand understanding of the nuance. Okay, so let's move on to deprescribing. So this has been a hot topic for a number of years. It continues to be a really important topic in the pharmacy world. And again, it was mentioned at the American Geriatric Society meeting. So just make sure everybody's on the same page. What is deprescribing? And the formal definition is the planned supervised process of reducing or stopping medications that may no longer be of benefit or may be causing harm. And the goal is to reduce medication burden and harm while maintaining or improving quality of life. So all of the things that I mentioned on one of the early slides kind of wrapped up into the definition of deprescribing. Reduce burden, reduce adverse effects, reduce this, and make sure your patient has a good quality of life. And also the medication choices are in line with what matters to them, helps them main, maintain their mobility, helps maintain their mentation at the level that they're at. Um, so it's all wrapped up in there. Now, when I'm talking to family members or caregivers, the word deprescribing has kind of a weird connotation for them. It's like takes like taking away. Um, so the way I kind of approach it with them, and I know you, somebody may disagree with with the way I approach this, but I at least provide my rationale, is that if you tell somebody that you're optimizing your medications, it feels more I don't know, it feels more positive than we're taking your medications away. So the language matters, um, and ideally optimizing medications also has this, you know, this shared decision-making um, aspect to it as well. So we need to understand what's important to the patient and or their family and caregivers so that we can kind of apply that to making decisions about what medications. Um, again, why do we care about deprescribing? It reduces the problem with polypharmacy over prescribing. It reduces adverse 
drug reactions. There are economic benefits to patients. They don't have to have a cabinet full of medications, so they don't have to pay as much, um, depending on what their insurance coverage is like, um, so they can have some economic benefits. And there are lots of case reports of, hey, my mom wasn't doing well, and she entered hospice care, and we started deprescribing medications, and wow, she kind of perked up and has been, you know, really doing well. So there may be some quality of life benefits, especially if the patient's been on a medication on the Beers criteria that has been affecting their mentation or affecting their mobility. So um, trying to rationally kind of take medications off of a patient's uh, profile can be really helpful in, re in uh, supporting their quality of life. So how do we do it? Well, we can use some tools um, to do that to identify potentially um, uh, potential medications for deprescribing. And the tool that you probably would use most frequently would be the Beers criteria, which we just spent a lot of time talking about. There are also some protocols available at deprescribing.org that can help you kind of target what medications may be good target. Um, and then uh, as we'll see in our case example, gee, what if the patient has lots of medications? How do you prioritize deprescribing? Which ones do you kind of target first, second, third? And there's a few ways we can do that, whether it's by addressing an adverse event, addressing by risk, by medication class or adherence. So we can identify the medications using these tools. We can prioritize and then we would use a staged approach that would be kind of implemented slowly with lots of monitoring, um, looking for adverse events, looking for withdrawal syndromes, looking for worsening condition. And sometimes you end up putting the patient back on, but maybe at a lower dose and reconsidering and trying again. So is this sort of an iterative process? Um, so, and then in the middle, there's that part about engaging the patient and obtaining their assent. So that part of, hey, we wanna optimize your medications. We're worried about the risk. This is the risk. You can use Bright Beer's criteria to help explain the risk. And then we'd like to develop a plan to reduce the dose, temporarily hold, completely discontinue your medications to reduce your risk for, um, for whatever the, whatever the an undesirable outcome would be, whether it's uh, risk of delirium, risk of falls, risk of you know precipitating uh, or worsening or making people more at risk for dementia. Okay. Um, a couple of other comments I wanted to add in here in terms of determining risky medications. Um, there was a couple of studies done. The first one was done in the, gosh, that was a long time ago, 2011. And what I want you to take away from this graphic is that these are the estimated rates of emergency hospitalizations for adverse drug events from 2007 to 2009. And we just spent a whole bunch of time talking about beers criteria. But what I want you to take away from that is, well, it's important to focus on and think about and reduce the risk from beers criteria medications. Look at the ones that are on the left side that actually result in way more hospitalizations or ED visits and ED hospitalizations than beers criteria. So things that make you bleed and things that cause low blood sugar and then opioids. So in terms of risky medications, beers criteria meds are important, but don't forget about the ones that your patients are commonly on that aren't necessarily on beers criteria. Um, that group also did a follow-up study, which was just published a couple of years ago. This time, they didn't focus on older adults. They focused on all age ranges. And a couple of things I wanted to point out to you here is that the estimated annual rates per thousand are much, 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 much higher for patients who are 65. And that's indicated by the red, the red circled area. Um, and the thing about the um, the ED visits for medication harms in older adults, the majority of them, the vast majority of them are due to therapeutic use. Unlike younger age ranges where it was like an unsupervised exposure, like the little kid got in a big bottle of vitamins and ate them all. Um, and then, you know, one of the parents discovered it later. So un contrasting that with 
therapeutic use in older adults. So, um, so be thinking about that. So beers criteria is important, but also common medications that a lot of people are on can, can, uh, can be pretty risky also. Um, so um, the list from this most recent study from 2021 didn't really change that much from the 2011. You'll see a couple of new medications on here. Um, the reason they weren't on the last round is because they weren't the medications were not available in the United States yet or anywhere actually they had not yet been approved so you'll see a pixaban uh, rivaroxaban have popped up on the list as oral anticoagulants um, so again my takeaway is the things that were present in the first study are still present here so things that can cause bleeding things that can cause hypoglycemia and uh, and uh, opioids. Uh, metformin popped up in there. I'm not sure what that's about. I'm not sure what that's about. Maybe some lactic acidosis or something. Yeah. And then lisinopril, probably from hyperkalemia. Okay. So beers criteria important. Don't forget about the common ones that can cause bleeding, um, hypoglycemia. Okay. Um, there are some resources for deprescribing. Um, there are a couple of websites. They're kind of interconnected. The Canadian group has been doing work on this for quite a long time. So you can navigate to their website. They have algorithms, pamphlets. They've got patient education handouts. They've got webinars. They've also got things like um, algorithms on how to help deprescribe certain drugs. And I've picked the benzo, diazepines, and Z drugs. And so this kind of gives you step-by-step -step, uh, instructions on how to approach the problem. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out to here is that there's an option kind of toward the right of the screen over here. Oops, sorry, I was trying to, uh, oops. I was trying to highlight, but that didn't work. Um, under the far right pathway, you can actually see an option for continuing the benzodiazepine receptor antagonist. So again, this is in line with, with um, the Beers criteria in that, you know, sometimes it makes sense, especially if other things have been tried and haven't been as effective as you would like. Okay, so this kind of gives you a stepwise approach how to approach uh, how to think about it. In the middle, there is engaging the patient. Uh, making sure that it's tapered so that the patient doesn't experience withdrawal syndromes. There's some monitoring um, and then, um, you know, some additional treatments or uh, approaches that can be used in conjunction with deprescribing to help a patient come off of a Z drug. So the, um, the Canadian group has, I think, five algorithms now. Uh, for proton pump inhibitors, antihyperglycemics, benzos and Z drugs, antipsychotics, and anticholinesterase inhibitors, and memantine. So each one looks kind of like this. I pulled this one out to share with you um, just as an example, but these are easily available um, if you just go to their websites and look for the algorithms. And then lastly, because there's a patient aspect to this, um, you know. Sometimes it takes a little bit more um, relationship building, trust building, working with the patient to kind of understand where they're at if you're working on deprescribing. And so this may give you some additional tips on how to approach that. So thinking about things in terms of, I, I think I focused a lot so far on the, the blue portion of the rainbow, which is the physical, which is pill burden, uh, stuff that is like, um, uh, adverse effects, how it affects the uh, activities of daily living, quality of life, but there's also a financial aspect in terms of health insurance. There are some social aspects about that include things like the influence of family and friends, what kind of social support system a patient has. There may be some culture-specific factors that may um, either help or hinder a patient in considering deprescribing. And then the same thing about the psychological and clinical aspects of deprescribing. So I share this with you in case, you know, you need some additional support and knowing how to approach a patient um, and helping them make a decision 
to, um, to, to come off some of their medications. All right, quickly, let's talk about prescribing cascades. Um, this is a prescribing cascade. Um, there's actually been a lot of work done on prescribing cascades by the same Canadian group that does a lot of the deprescribing work. And I heard from one of their um, uh, contributors um, at the AGS meeting, she did a whole program on prescribing cascades. I think I've pulled out like the most salient points to help you get through um, kind of thinking about prescribing cascades. But again, I think this is another developing area. We're gonna see a whole lot more of it um, in the next few years. So how does a prescribing cascade work? The patient's on a drug, mm, then they get a new symptom or a new medical condition. And that thing that you've observed is sometimes related to the initial drug therapy, but it's not recognized as that. And so a new drug treatment is added on to that. So this adds to polypharmacy and morbidity. And then just one key note about prescribing cascades is the timeline or the sequence of events is important when you're assessing for a prescribing cascade. So if the patient has a side effect and then a new medication is started, that seems that that fits the pattern. But if I'm giving you, all right, I'm gonna give you a hand. In our case, patient case, the sequence of events doesn't match up for it to be a prescribing cascade. So you, you gotta kind of know what happens first, second, third, in order to determine whether something is truly a prescribing cascade. Um, this is some of the newer work that's coming out of that group in Canada called Think Cascades. Uh, I think this gives you a number of very common uh, prescribing cascades that affect older people and it's broken down by physiologic system. Um, I think one of the more classic ones that we, that I, at least I learned when I was in school was you start somebody on a calcium channel blocker, you know, like amlodipine, you know, one of the side effects is edema. Um, but if somebody doesn't recognize that as a side effect, then there could be a new drug added on top of that, like furosemide. Uh, another one, patients on a diuretic for some reason, say heart failure, they have incontinence. And so then a new medication is added on to manage the incontinence. Uh, the other, so here's a, a handful that you can kind of, kind of review and consult as necessary, but there are a handful out there. Um, and the idea, at least for me bringing this to you um, today, is that it can maybe um, clue you in and allow you to think more carefully about your patient's medications so that um, you know you could see whether a prescribing cascade is happening. So how do how can we prevent cascades? Well, we can ask ourselves, hey, is this sign or symptom? Could that have been caused by a drug? So before you take any action, before any specialist referral or test or new medications, ask, could this be caused by a drug? And then if you think it might be, you could decrease, pause, or potentially stop the agents and see if that sign or symptom improves. So a little mini deprescribing. And then there's also the possibility of using some non-drug approaches to treat emergent symptoms um, once you've um, ruled out the potential for side effects. Okay, so first thing is recognizing that it may be an issue and then taking it from there before adding on extra tests and visits and medications. All right, good. Let's talk about our case study. Let's apply some of these concepts to our case study. So this is a patient that I um, was involved in caring for for a number of years. Um, I met him when he was in his early 90s. Um, he is a living alone in a retirement community. Uh, he lives in one of those assisted living um, uh, uh, re retirement communities, but he's pretty independent. So he takes care of all his ADLs and IADLs. He manages his own bills. He takes his own medications. Uh, really, the only thing he doesn't do any longer is drive. But he lives in a community where they have the bus that does the grocery shopping. And so he takes care of all of that. A little bit more about him so you get a full picture of, of who he is as a person. So he's a World War II vet. He was in the Pacific Theater. Uh, he, um, he, after he uh, uh, finished his military service, 
He worked as an office manager for an insurance company. He's very active in his church. So he's a member of the Church of the Latter-day Saints or the Mormons. Um, within the community, he's on the resident council where they arrange to have scholarships for some of the, the folks who work there. They fund a couple of scholarships every year. So he's really involved in, in determining that. Um, his wife died a few years ago, so that's why he's living alone. He's got an adult son in the area and an adult daughter who lives in the Midwest. He speaks with his daughter every day on the phone. Um, he talks to his son a little less frequently than, than that, but so I think his daughter is a, a lot more closer to him in terms of connection, even though she lives uh, farther away. And he's really active, so he participates in the walking club, the exercise class, classes, brain fitness classes, current events. So he's living really a, a full life. All right, so here we go. Let's see. He's got um, uh, history. So, uh, so let me back up. So we're going to take his case and we're going to look at it through a few different lenses. So let's start out with the four M's. So a little bit more about him, his medical history. You can see that he's got multi-morbidity. So he's got a number of chronic medical conditions, including atrial fibrillation, hypertension, diabetes, diabetic neuropathy, hypothyroid, stage three kidney disease, insomnia, GERD, macular degeneration. So multimorbidity and polypharmacy. Look at that. <laughs> yeah, so he's on a lot of different medications a lot of different medications. And so when I first started working with him, I was like, hmm, what's important to him? Because that will affect how I manage his medications. And so based on this portion of his life right now, he wants to maintain his independence as long as possible, his level of mobility as long as possible, his mentation at its current state as long as possible. And he'd like to do that with fewer medications. Okay, so when I look at this, that helps me decide that, okay, we want to keep the medications that's going to help him keep the mobility um, and mentation kind of in, good, in a good place where he's at right now. And so then I'm targeting, hmm, what medications could negatively affect that? Oops. And so a couple of things that I was thinking about is, hmm, the lorazepam could affect his mentation and his mobility. So that's kind of a, a, a worrisome for me. Same thing with gabapentin, it could make him drowsy, it could increase his risk of falls. Um, but overall, the medication choices should be made in the context of maintaining his current level of independence. Okay, so that's one lens to look through. The next lens is, okay, now let's look at the Beers criteria medications. So the slides are the same, but as I was going down the list, I was ticking off, oops, all of the medications that are on Beers criteria. So you can see a Pixaban, remember there's that new box, aspirin for primary prevention. So he actually, the, his indication for aspirin is primary prevention. Gabapentin is one of those medications that it needs to be adjusted for renal function. Insulin is on the Beers criteria, but if you read the rationale, it's sliding scale insulin only that's part of the Beers criteria. So technically this is okay, um, but remember this is also one of those high risk medications that you know could result in a, a, a uh, emergency department hospitalization for him. So that's on my lookout. And then the benzos, we all know benzos are really challenging uh, in terms of fall risk, delirium, uh, mentation. Um, so that's really troublesome. And then omeprazole, which has a number of risks associated with it, including fractures and potentially, um, you know, C. diff infection. So looking at this from the Beers criteria, there's a handful of medications, but not all of them are quite as concerning as others. Like apixaban is on there, but it's one of the safer anticoagulants, the direct or anticoagulants. So it's not warfarin, it's not dabigatran, it's not rivaroxaban. 
um, but it can cause bleeding, so it's of concern still, in my opinion. Um, aspirin for primary prevention, you can probably de-prescribe de that, um, which we actually did. Um, and then uh, a couple of things that were targeted highly was the lorazepam over time. Yeah, so I worked with him over probably 18 months to get the lorazepam titrated down and he was able to get off of it entirely, which I take that as a really great victory because deprescribing benzos can be one of the hardest things ever. Okay. Um, so now let's look at the same case through the lens of a prescribing cascade. What are the meds that you could kind of look back at the slides and determine which ones are on the prescribing cascade? In this case, it's amlodipine and furosemide. So if you don't understand the time course, you may go, aha, that's a prescribing cascade. But knowing him as well as I do, I knew he was on furosemide for lower leg edema before he got on amlodipine. So the sequence is does not make it a prescribing cascade. Now, when he started amlodipine, we were looking out to see if his leg swelling got worse, but it did not. So this, I would not consider this a prescribing cascade because it didn't, the furosemide was not added as a response to the amlodipine causing leg swelling. Okay. Now, in terms of deprescribing, remember this is intentional, it's meant to reduce the risk. The meds that I targeted for deprescribing were sort of a combination of all of the things that we've talked about on the prior lenses. So a couple of things, we can think about it by adverse event. Um, I know that when I first started working with him, he'd had five episodes of hypoglycemia in the month prior. And so that actually was my one of my top priorities is to help work on his insulin regimen so that he had fewer um, fewer hypoglycemic episodes. So that I considered that by by adverse event and by risk. Um, so I tackled that first before I did anything else. Again, the medications are same as what we've all had. How do we how do we decide? Oh my gosh, there's so many medications here. <laughs> um, underneath, uh, toward the bottom of the list, we've got some supplements and vitamins. I always consider those for deprescribing because they may be some of the quote easier ones to um, to help the patient feel okay coming off of. And sometimes if it's an easy one, you can build a trusting relationship in. So it can make some of the harder medications easier to, to talk about with them. So again, how do we approach this list? How do we prioritize? Because we can't just stop all of these all at once. And actually some of them we don't want to stop. Like apixaban is for uh, stroke prevention. Um, he's on a good dose. We just need to monitor for bleeding. So technically it's something to consider because of the risk of bleeding. However, there are benefits that outweigh those risks. So that would stay on. Aspirin probably can go away because it's for primary prevention. Uh, adjusting the dose of fosinopril, he had a little bit of hyperkalemia. So reducing the dose to, um, to minimize hyperkalemia, adjusting gabapentin for his current level of renal function, uh, targeting the insulin so that he didn't have episodes of hypoglycemia, thinking about the lorazepam so that he, <laughs> he can maintain his level of um, uh, you know, mentation and, and minimize risks of falls. Um, so I guess one of the, the takeaways from this is that it's really complex and you kind of have to work with the patient and you may have to kind of target the most riskiest, scariest ones first um, and then kind of go from there. And I think in the interest of time, I'm gonna show you kind of the, what happened after I worked with him for over 18 months, I was able to help him take his medication list of 17 medications, trim it down to 11 for which he was really happy. Um, he wanted to take fewer medications. He felt good. He felt just as good as he did when he took 17 medications, but he was no longer having hypoglycemia. He was completely off the benzo. He was off of some of those really high-risk medications. 
So I thought I did a good job and I wanted to share that with you. Um, and then one last thing before we transition over to a summary slide. Um, so I knew him for a few years. Um, let's fast forward for three years in which pretty much everything is the same, except now he has a new diagnosis of cancer. So how do we kind of take the four M's and apply that with this new information, this new situation? In this case, he, after consultation with specialists, he and his family opted for hospice care. And so knowing that that was his primary, um, what matters most to him was focusing on his comfort and symptom control. We could actually apply that matters most into looking at the medication list again and say, okay, how much is each of these medications is contributing to his comfort and then and taking that the next step. So again, this is meant to emphasize the importance of understanding what's important to the patient um, so that you can make the best choices and adjust the therapy that's best in line with, with, their, um, with what matters to them. Um, this happened, I wish I could offer some follow-up this happened like in April of 2020. So this was right after COVID lockdown. And so I actually never got to visit with him again. And so I, I have a lot of regrets about that, but I um, uh, at least wanted to share this with you so that you could see how, how patients' goals can change over time. All right, in summary, um, we wanna be careful about medications. Um, they need to be reviewed regularly. Um, you can use the four M's to, to inform choices about medications and that medication priorities can change over time and that patients and their families should be involved in decision-making about medication use. Thank you for sticking with me till the, the last end. And I think I, think I saw some questions pop up. Actually, those were just me popping those up. Those were you. <laughs> Links for people, sorry. <laughs> Okay, no problem. I um, was like, oh, is, is that a signal for me to wrap up? Yes, no, it is. No, no, no. <laughs> I was just trying to get it, it, a lot of links today. So <laughs> there's okay. a long one. Sorry. Well, it is, seven, uh, it is 515. So um, this was the designated time for me to stop anyway and take questions. So happy to, happy to take questions or comments at this time. This was just um, really comprehensive. One of the issues I think with this um, audience um, who have broad range of experience and um, different uh, disciplines and that sort of thing um, is uh, familiarity with the medications. Some are very familiar and some are not so familiar. Um, so I'm wondering if for those of us who are, are um, less familiar, if you have a few take home tips um, for working like um, you had mentioned that um, you that folks could refer patients to their pharmacist, right? Their mm -hmm. community pharmacist. Um, and to what extent, this is going to be a weird question, but to what extent do community pharmacists maybe do brown bag reviews of medications? Yeah, um, so this, this is a great question um, that um, many insurance um, providers, payers, do offer an annual review of medications with a pharmacist as part of their coverage. And so I think some of your patients may get soliciting kind of emails or um, letters in the mail or even phone calls offering a medication review. Um, that could be one way to do it. There are also, um, I I can't think of the website off the top of my head right now, but I can share that information um, later. Um, but there is a group of pharmacists that do consulting kind of work and patients can contact them individually for a more comprehensive review of medications. Um, so it's sort of like a pay for service kind of thing. Um, so there are some ways to uh, involve a pharmacy. And you know, many community pharmacies do offer a service, although it's hard for me to, I, I don't know how easy that is these days with um, kind of the short staffing that many pharmacies are facing. So I think maybe the better approach would be to 
can kind of do it through the payer um, or to um, contact um, uh, those people who do it on individual consultation basis. So I will follow up with that information. Okay, that's interesting. I hadn't known about that. Yeah. Uh, Hannah asks, for many people, medications are viewed um, as an easy, effective, concrete solution for their diagnosis. How do you address this in deprescribing to help people get comfortable with the idea yeah. of fewer medications, even if their problem list hasn't changed? Yeah, this is a great question, right? Especially the idea that you're taking something away. And, and especially for people who've you know been really active in their care and they're like, I'm doing all of the things and I'm taking all these meds and now suddenly... You're telling, you know, my doctor for years has told me to do all of this stuff and now you're telling me to stop doing it. So it, it kind of, you know, creates a little bit of confusion. Um, so there's been some recent work um, where kind of getting people uh, kind of focus on how the language is used when you're talking to people about this. So that's one of the reasons I called out the optimizing your medication. So, so saying things like, you know, when you were 45, your body was different and it handled medications differently than now that you're whatever whatever the age is now. So we wanna optimize your medications. Um, um, one of the ways that has been studied in through a survey study of like, I, like 800 people, I think it was a survey study. One of the things that patients who participated in the survey Pre they preferenced statements that focused on side effects of medications. So for example, if you were to talk to a patient and say, hey, I see you're on a benzodiazepine and I'm really concerned about the side effects of this medication and the side effects include, and you can lay it all out and that can make them more willing to listen and to be willing to participate in de-prescribing. Um, so, so there's been work on like focusing on, hey, I'm worried about you and the side effects that this medication may cause. That's one way. And there's a, that same group in Canada that I've referenced already has done a study through a community pharmacy, no less, in Canada, where they sent out a flyer, a mailing, a brochure to both the prescriber and the patient. And the brochure was like, hey, did you know the medication you're on can increase your risk of falling? And here are some ways that you can handle that. And here are some ways you could come off the medication. And so, um, so like one of the things that I took away from that approach is that people are willing to consider, especially if they know their doctor is willing to consider deprescribing. So that kind of connection. Um, yeah, if, if the prescriber says, hey, I'm concerned about this, then the patient seems to be, well, I don't wanna say all patients, but yeah, they're, there can be more willingness to consider. Um, and then I've had success with starting with the, the quote, easy ones, like, hey, maybe you don't need to take this vitamin every day and we can come up with a plan and we can, you know, and then, you know, having, I, I guess the biggest takeaway is that in order for this to work well, you have to have a, a good relationship with the patient and have some trust um, and, you know, and you may not be able to get them to consider deprescribing right away, but if you keep at it, maybe someday they'll change. But the language really matters. And so optimizing your medication, I, I find pretty effective and also focusing on the reason for, for taking medications away or reducing the dose. If you tell them this is to minimize side effects, that can get, get a lot of traction, I think. Thanks for your question. Um, so, um, Beth said that she loved how you integrated the 4Ms throughout the lecture with so much specialization in medicine and multiple providers and incomplete communication. Polypharmacy seems to be rampant. Mm. The pharmacist is a great resource for patients. This is a great and useful lecture. Um, I agree that Thank and, you. And part of the problem is they're also using different pharmacies. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I know this is really hard. I mean, I always try to get, I always recommend using the same pharmacy so that it can, you know, the pharmacy system can do the drug interaction screening, the duplication screening. Um, 
But yeah, I know some pharmacies offer coupons and then some stuff comes through mail order. And so, yeah, it's, yeah, I, w I wish I had an answer. I wish I had an answer. Yeah. Well, uh, and, you know, I, I think in some ways it's a, many ways, it's a really good thing that they're um, moving um, some medication to over the counter, but then those don't get tracked. That's well. right. That's right. And in fact, some of the medications over the counter, like, Benadryl yeah. are strongly anticholinergic. And so, and that is in sleep aid. So it's not just for allergies. You've got diphenhydramine or Benadryl in medications that help you sleep. Um, and so you're right, it doesn't get tracked and it's a medication that's strongly anticholinergic. So like that, this is kind of a bad combination. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think this group has heard me say before, I'm embarrassed that you know, over 30 years ago, when I worked in coronary care, that's what we were routinely given everybody was Benadryl at night. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. help them sleep, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and just to clarify again for this group, the beers criteria doesn't address over-the-counter supplements, herbals. To... It does not. It does not. So it, it may address some things that are over the counter, but it's by ingredient. So, but you're right; it does not include supplements, herbal products. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions, folks? I have put the links for some of the um, evaluation, the attendance log, and CEs in the chat. So, look for that, and also look for the email that came across at about five p.m. Um, but Dr. Mike, thank you so much. This is really such an important topic and I'm glad to get the latest and greatest. And it's yeah. interesting to see that that beers criteria keeps evolving, doesn't it? It does. Yeah, incrementally getting better and better every year. <laughs> All right, thank you for inviting me. Yes, thank you. And thanks everyone for attending the series um, this term. Hope to see many, most all of you um, in January of 2024. Bye. Yay.